Hi, I'm Daniela. I'm a journalist and founder of TheDailyTale.com, a pet blog with over 3 million page views. This is the first video of a series of videos I want to make about veterinary issues, and today Dr. Sarah Casabon will talk to us. She graduated with honors in 1996 at Harvard, and she got her DVM degree at Cornell in 2001. Today she is Chief of Staff at Fresh Pond Animal Hospital in Massachusetts, where I take my three dogs and four cats. Uh, she's going to talk to us about what happens when you give anti-inflammatories for people to your cats and dogs. Anti-inflammatories are also called NZs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, please note that this interview does not replace a vet visit, so if you uh, by any chance gave your uh, pets any people meds by mistake or your pet is sick, please uh, call your veterinarian right away, okay? Uh, enjoy the video. Hi, Dr. Casabon. Thank Hi. you. Thank you for doing this. Um, this is um, our first video for the Daily Tale, and um, I was hoping that you could help us with uh, some information about anti-inflammatories for dogs and cats. Absolutely. Well, basically, the reason why we don't use the uh, human products as much as we do the uh, the veterinary approved products is because the medications block the pathways of inflammation at different stages mm. and oftentimes it's based on um, certain enzymes or things like that that cats and dogs may not have um, I see. or there could be uh, cha or worsening side effects. So aspirin, which is a, it's a, not a non-steroidal, but is the most common or oldest anti-inflammatory that we have, um, it can be used in dogs and cats. The problem is with dogs is that they tend to have a lot of um, gastrointestinal side effects where it can actually cause bleeding. Uh -huh. uh, and with cats, the issue with them is that it's the sort of the length of effectiveness so they their dose is very very small and you know like every three days I see so the other issue um, was that Tylenol in, in particular which is also another anti-inflammatory is uh, extremely toxic to cats cats can actually die because they lack a certain enzyme in their liver um, to process the acetaminophen um, I see. And they can, de they develop a blood problem, basically a blood dyscrasia. Okay. Which can actually kill them. So. And for dogs, how, how does it work for dogs? You know, it doesn't actually work that well. It's not very efficacious for dogs. Okay. Uh, I, uh, you know, can it cause the same problems that it can in a cat? I think to a smaller degree. Um, but the issue with acetaminophen is that one, it's something you have to give frequently, just like how people take it. I mean, you usually take a Tylenol every four to six hours, and that was not very convenient for people to give to their dogs. Mm -hmm. um, the other was how how it worked, and it, it doesn't tend to work very well um, as far as decreasing inflammation and pain. Uh huh. And uh, how how is the ibuprofen? Uh, is it very toxic, really, for cats and dogs? So ibuprofen, Aleve, and aspirin are all can cause a lot of gastrointestinal bleeding, okay. and so that's why we don't recommend it. Um, okay. It actually can, in some cases, cause intestinal rupturing oh um, with severe ulceration of the, of the intestines. Wow. Okay. Uh, but I know that... Um, Many vets recommend aspirin sometimes, and I remember that um, Frida had a few years ago one of um, one of those muscle sprains from running, mm -hmm. and it was a weekend, so I, I didn't have an appointment with you, so yep. I just decided to give her an aspirin, and then she was a week in pain because I had to wait this whole week to give her Rimadyl. So right. is it really worth uh, prescribing aspirin, really? Because I was thinking that if I have to wait a week and my dog's going to be in pain, I don't want him to be uncomfortable, you know? What do you think? Well, the issue is, in that particular instance, is that we were switching from one medication to yeah. the And the, even in human medicine, we don't have a clear um, indication of how long 
the washout period is between medications. And the, uh, by washout period, I mean that the bo- the medication has been cleared from the system. Yeah. Because we never want to use two of these medications um, at the same time because it actually makes the side effects cumulative. Uh-huh. Same thing with steroids and anti-inflammatories. If a patient is on prednisone or something like that, we would never want to use aspirin or Rimadol or anything like that on top of that. Um, so we kind of unfortunately need to make it up, the washout period. So uh, as uh, in the veterinary industry, we've all decided a week seems to make sense. It could be shorter um, or uh, I don't really think it's longer than seven days, but we feel comfortable with that length of time to avoid potential side effects in the patients. I see. And, of course, the Rimadil, I understand that is more effective than uh, just taking aspirin, right? So right. maybe it would be best if we just gave them the Rimadil. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is is that many people have aspirin in their house. Yeah, um, that's why I did. Yeah. It's readily available. Uh, and, and so... In a time when the veterinarian may not be open, and and we that's what we take ourselves, we sort of make the assumption like, oh, let's give it to our dog. Um, but there's also a range of dose. You know, sometimes uh, depending on the size of the dog, most aspirin comes in 325 milligram, but we always recommend using a buffered aspirin or an enteric coated aspirin oh. uh, because that has extra protective effects for the GI. I see. But some, the dosing for aspirin for some dogs, like your dogs who are large and giant breed, is almost up to two. But most clients aren't going to give that much. So, so in some ways, that's good. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, that's a good thing, I guess. Nobody's going to get intoxicated. <laughs> uh, and truth be told, I, you know, I have found that aspirin isn't that great. And I'm, I, I'm sure many of your viewers know the diff- or have heard the difference between a COX-1 and a COX-2 with um, with these anti-inflammatories, specifically in people, you know, uh, many of them that were taken off the market uh, were causing problems with heart, pro- you know, heart issues and things like that because they were actually blocking pathways that are, are important and protective. I see.